Okay, welcome back everyone to DSE 102, um, Systems for Scalable Analytics. This is the last, but not the least, probably one of the most exciting ones we've had is industry guest lecture from uh, Ponder and the folks who also created and maintained Modin. We have Rehan Durrani and Alejandro Herrera, hope I pronounce your names right. So they're gonna tell us about um, the stuff that they've been building. So Alejandro is a solution architect at Ponder, the company that is commercializing Modin. And he has worked with users across industries on their data science workflows, how to scale that. He's also worked at C3.ai and data science consulting before for enterprise customers. Rehan is one of the core developers of Modin and a founding engineer at Ponder. He graduated from UC Berkeley in ECS and he's worked before on Modin, Ray, and other open source research projects like Clipper and has published in several top tier venues, including VLDB, about some of this work. So it's great to have you both. Thank you for joining us. And again, just, just as I was explaining to you, so these students have worked with um, uh, DAS data frames and have, are very familiar with the uh, pandas and such. It's really something that we're looking forward to learning more about Modin. Hopefully for a future edition of this class, we will switch to Modin, like I was saying. So with that, I'll leave it to you, Alejandro and Rehan, who wants to go first? Yeah, can you see my screen? We can see your screen, yes. Okay, and if I do full screen mode, it, it shows oh, properly and everything. Okay, uh, thanks for having us, Arun. Uh, always a pleasure. Um, as I said before, for everybody, please jump in with questions. Um, hopefully, uh, you'll you'll be able to learn a few things here and there, uh, and 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 take this into practice in in your future coursework. So, uh, in terms of the key topics we want to cover today, um, brief introductions of Rehan and myself. We're going to tell you a little bit about Modin, the open source project. We're going to talk to you a little bit about how industry is using Modin for different types of use cases, show you a really quick demo, and then show you under the hood on how this thing is working. Um, and Rehan's really going to dig into that. And not many better people to talk about that since Rehan did a lot of the design work and implementation there. Um, Rehan, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm blushing, Arun and Alejandro. You're too kind. So I'm Rehan Durrani. Uh, I graduated from UC Berkeley with a bachelor's in EECS about two years ago, back in 2020. Uh, ever since I was a freshman, I worked at RISE Lab. That's the lab that uh, Spark and Databricks came out of. Uh, I've worked on research projects like Arun mentioned, Moden, Ray, Clipper, read some of them. Uh, sorry, led some of them. And uh, today I'm a founding engineer at Ponder. Uh, super excited to be here. Alejandro? Thanks. Uh, I'm a solution architect. For those who don't know what that means, I, I do a little bit of everything. Uh, I help build demos, proof of concepts. I work with users to make sure that we're building Modin in a way that can help them scale their workflows. Um, so a lot, I, I, my job is fun because I get to see a lot of the ways in which people are actually using our technology out in the field. Um, and if you have any questions about that, happy to answer them. So, to start off a little bit about Modin, um, most people in this class already know Pandas, so I won't belabor the point, but a lot of people really like Pandas because it's so easy to use and so flexible. Uh, one of the crazy fun facts that I learned relatively recently is that Pandas has been downloaded more than 2 billion times and I think the weekly download rate is over 20 million downloads a week right now. So needless to say, it's everywhere and very popular. Um, and anybody who takes an intro to Python class learns Pandas. Uh, the issue that we have been seeing is that it doesn't scale. The way Pandas was designed doesn't take full advantage of the resources in the environment. So this graphic on the left-hand side just shows that no matter how many resources you have available on your machine or in your cluster, if you're using Pandas, it's only going to use one of the cores. So as you throw more machines, as you increase the size of your instance, you're still going to have scalability issues. You're still going to run out of memory. 
Uh, and that's really a, a key pain point. And so because of that, what we've seen is that a lot of teams start off, if, if you think of this as kind of like the development process from beginning to end, you start off doing prototyping. Usually we see people do that in Pandas in a local environment. Then as they want to test out their analysis or their hypotheses or, or, or their models on more realistic data and it's time to scale up, they have to refactor into other frameworks like the ones you've seen in this course, some including Dask and Spark. And then you might have to rewrite it again as you move things into production uh, and, and kind of iterate. And because you're using tools, different tools for different steps of the process, and usually in industry, we see different teams are in charge of different steps all of the fragmentation in, in those different tools tends to really slow down uh, teams from a development perspective. And so when we noticed this, we kind of took a step back and saw that in the top left-hand side, we had a set of tools that was really e e easy to use, but hard to scale like Pandas. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, we saw tools that are highly performant that have been proved at massive scale, but as I'm sure you've all experienced, aren't always very easy to use. And that's fundamentally what we were solving for with Modin is giving, giving practitioners tools that are easy to use and also flexible. So that's where Modin comes in. That's our open source project. Uh, you can pip install it if you want to get going. And it's really a drop-in replacement for Pandas. And what that means is all you have to do is change your import statement, and then the rest of your code stays the same. And out of the box, you see performance improvements in terms of runtime as well as memory efficiency. Uh, in terms of a little bit more color on, on, on the open source project and where it's been and where it's going, uh, we've been getting a ton of organic traction, uh, recently crossed the 4 million download threshold. We have a growing community of contributors. It's used in industry all over the place. And uh, one of the really neat things that drew me to join the team uh, was the foundation and research that Rehan is going to talk about, right? There's so many new open source projects every week. And one thing that got me really excited about Modin was all of the, the core research that went into developing the, the, the core system. Um, so a couple of examples of, of how, we're, how we're seeing Modin used in industry, um, just to make things a little bit more tangible. Um, one thing that's that's a requirement in the financial services industry. Some of you may have heard of stress testing and uh, scenario analysis. Um, we've been working with a large financial institution um, to optimize the performance of those scenario and, and risk analysis pipelines. So um, one of the really common patterns that we see in industry is that the people who really understand the domain and the business aren't always the people that have the computer science and systems background. So you might be a, 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 you know, a brilliant financial modeler, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean that you're going to have the computer science background to optimize and scale a pipeline. And so in this case, um, they had written this, this risk planning or this scenario analysis pipeline using Pandas, they were having some performance issues with that Pandas implementation. And we went in and basically simplified the implementation, dropped in, mowed in, and we were able to see between five and eight X performance improvements on the slowest steps in that whole pipeline. Uh, so that was pretty neat. Um, this is another really fun use case. Uh, Rehan and I worked on this together, actually. So um, Snorkel, it's a 
uh, data labeling platform. Um, we work closely with their team to um, speed up the data labeling process. So Snorkel, just for background, they they have a platform and users use it to programmatically label data sets for machine learning. So basically creating labels for training data. Uh, we, we, we partnered with them so that they could use Modin in their platform and we're helping them label their data or we're helping the, speed up their platform labeling by more than 2X and also improving the efficiency of how, how things are managed in memory pretty significantly. So that was a fun project. Uh, finally, this is a, another pretty neat one. I don't know if folks on this call have had a chance to uh, tinker with NLP, um, things like hugging face models, which is which is kind of the state of, they offer a lot of state of the art NLP models for things like sentiment analysis. This is a fun use case, and I'm actually going to show you what it looks like and, and demo you demo this for you, um, where basically you had this competitive analysis analyzing a bunch of restaurant review data um, to to figure out you know what are the trends in in consumer sentiment towards different restaurant uh, companies. Um, there were performance issues with the existing implementation of this sentiment analysis pipeline. And by just dropping in Modin, we were able to see more than 10x speed ups on that sentiment analysis. Um, so that's kind of a, a fun use case. Uh, while I switch over to the demo, any questions? I guess not so far. We can continue. Okay. Um, so this is this is a variation on the on the work um, that I just described, and it's related to one of the team's favorite restaurants, uh, folks at Ponder, including uh, I think Rehan and Devin and some of the others really like Taco Bell. And we always, when we get together, we we just had a retreat last week. We're always kind of debating what we're going to have for dinner. Um, so this is kind of a toy example to highlight that. Um, in this case, um, we took a bunch of publicly available restaurant data and we're comparing the sentiment of Taco Bell reviews versus other Mexican restaurants. Uh, in, we start off by just importing vanilla pandas as old PD and Modin as PD. And so I'm going to walk you through the different like classic steps in the, the modeling process from ingestion to pre-processing to actually doing the sentiment analysis. Um, so in this side-by-side -side comparison, where we're just reading in the data, you'll see that I'm doing a, a standard read CSV from this restaurant data that I have in, in these flat files. You can see that if I, if I just copy and paste the code and I keep the syntax identical, I'm getting 3x speed ups on reading the data without having to change my code. So here is the Pandas implementation, here's the Modin implementation. If you look at the syntax, it's exactly the same, but the runtime is significantly different. Um, if we just kind of peek at, at the, the data to understand what's in it, um, just for context, the business table has the basic business profile information. So we have the idea of the, the business, um, the category of the business. So on the right-hand side, you can see if it's a restaurant or what type of restaurant or maybe some other type of shop. The reviews table is pretty self-explanatory. It has the stars and the text of the actual review. Um, one of the things that's really nice about Modin and, and the team has really done a fantastic job in, in doing this is making sure that the user experience totally mirrors Pandas. So if you see how I've previewed this data or printed out a couple of 
summary statistics, it looks and feels exactly like pandas, but it's actually Modin. Um, so now to, to the, the fun stuff of comparing Taco Bell versus not Taco Bell, um, we want to ultimately calculate um, the sentiment of Taco Bell versus not Taco Bell. And for any NLP problem, we always do pre-processing to get the text data in um, the right structure for the actual sentiment modeling. In this case, we do uh, some pretty simple pre-processing and I won't get into the details of every single line of code, but I'm, I'm cleaning up, I'm, I'm um, lower casing the strings of the text data. I'm doing, uh, I'm truncating the string to make sure that they're relatively consistent. Uh, and we can see that if I compare the pre-processing with pandas and pre-processing with Modin, I'm getting about two times faster pre-processing. Again, just copy and pasting pandas code and comparing it with Modin and the syntax is identical. Um, so next, once I have the data ready to model and do my sentiment analysis, I am ready to actually do the pipeline and 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 go and label through my through my uh, data frame whether a Taco Bell review is happy or sad or angry or surprised. Um, first step is to define that classification pipeline. So I'm just showing here. And we, we won't get into all the details on the NLP side, but we're, we have this classification pipeline. It's using a hugging face uh, model for that classification with pandas. So just for context, I have a Mexican food review data frame that I created. And if you, if you see here, I am applying the sentiment classifier on all of the reviews to generate the label of, is it a happy review or is it a sad review? And with, I think it's just about, just under four gigs of data, that, that classification pipeline runs for about five hours and then crashes because it's using pandas as a core data frame structure there. If I do the exact same thing, again, copy paste, the syntax is identical, but this Mexican food review data frame is a modem data frame. It runs in 20 minutes, which is at, a, at, at least 12 times faster than that five hour mark that we saw earlier. And I end up getting my results. Um, so hopefully that gives you a sense of modem industry use cases, some practical examples of, of how you might be able to test it out. Uh, any questions before I hand it over to Rehan? So Alejandro, I have a quick question. There's a whole chit chat going on, but I have a technical question. On the gaps that you reported with uh, Modin, is that because of better use of multi-core? Is that the only reason that uh, compared with Pandas, which was single core, Modin was able to use all cores better on that machine where you ran that notebook? Or are there other reasons too? Um, let me let me make sure I understand your question. You're saying that the when you refer to gaps, you're you're meaning the, the performance the, gaps with pandas and modin. Does that arise mainly because modin is using all the cores better, whereas pandas does not? Is that the only reason? Uh, I would say the parallelization. So using all the cores is one piece, but also our ability to manage things in memory more efficiently is right. also another piece. And Rehan, I think that's a great segue into what Rehan's going to talk about, which is what's going on under the hood and why is it different than Pandas and 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 all that good stuff. Um, Sounds good. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I think I we some... they are chit chatting about Michelin star restaurants and Pandas Express, which is your marketing material, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On restaurants versus fast food restaurants. Okay, let's get to Rehan. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Arun. Uh, so let me share my screen and I have a set of slides to go over. Uh, cool. Can folks see my slides? Yes. Fantastic. Thank you, Arun. 
Uh, so, like Alejandro said, people love pandas, but why? You know, what's so special about data frames that make them so useful and so interesting? The short answer is data frames offer a wide variety of operations from different data modalities combined into one easy to visualize representation of tabular data. So what does that mean? Data frames are flexible. That's the key takeaway here. We really begin to see this flexibility when we take a look at what a data frame is and what it can do. So what is a data frame? Formally, a data frame is an array of data along with a set of column labels that often denote semantic meaning, a set of real labels that are similarly semantic in nature, and a schema that provides a mapping from column name to the type of data in that column. Like we said earlier, data frames are flexible. Like arrays, they support positional at random access as well as a transpose operator, but they also support label-based random access like with databases. Their schemas are flexible. So, you know, if I or your coworker or your project partner gives you a CSV and they're like, hey, can you like do some analysis on this? I want to know like a bunch of different statistics. You don't have to go through the CSV and be like, okay, like we have this column, this column, this column, and the type of data for each column is, you know, this type, that type, whatever. Pandas will automatically infer the schema for you based on a during data ingest, right? And if you decide down the line, you know, like, oh, I want to change the type of this column, that's possible. You know, with traditional databases, the schema needs to be specified beforehand and is fixed for the entire duration of that table. You know, and data frames also support order, which is really useful when we're doing practical applications like time series analysis. So since data frames are so interesting, you know, why are we having this conversation now? Data frames were first introduced to the Python ecosystem around a decade ago. So why don't we have more scalable data frame systems? You know, and the answer lies in three key challenges. The first is the massive API. So ironically, the flexibility of data frames kind of hurts them a little bit. The Pandas API has 240 unique operators, which makes it really hard to optimize by hand. The second problem is parallel execution. So, you know, you, most of most, if not all of you, I think are data scientists. So, you know, that data frames involve a lot of operations that access data differently, right? Sometimes you do operations that are row-wise, sometimes you do column-wise, sometimes you do cell-wise. That means it's really hard to optimize all these operations with one strategy because they involve accessing data in different ways. The third problem is that uh, data frames have variable data shape. So, you know, databases, traditionally, they're tall and skinny. That just means you have very few columns and very many rows, right? Data frames can also be tall and skinny, but thanks to the transpose operator, they can also be wide and short. So many columns, few rows. So this induces additional complexity in a system designed to scale data frames. So how do we solve these problems, right? At the Moden team, we had three key insights. The first is our data frame decomposition rules that allow us to effectively partition data frames. The second is the principle of metadata independence that allows us to more efficiently compute data frame operations. And the third, and my favorite, uh, actually, no, uh, I like all three equally, <laughs> uh, the data frame algebra. This is the minimal set of 16 operators that's a lot easier to optimize. You know, think 16 versus 240, I'd pick the 16. Yeah. So in the next couple of slides, we're going to do a bit of a high level deep dive into like these three things and why they're important. Feel free again to stop me if folks have questions and want to get into like more of the technical details. And you can also read about all of these in our most recent VLDB paper. So data frame decomposition. Why do I care about data frame decomposition? So when you're doing operations in pandas, you know, you can do them along the rows or along the columns, right? So say you want to take the mean of all the columns, right? That can be parallelized across all the columns. If you want to take the max of every row, that can be parallelized across every row. But you can't do the opposite, right? I can't parallelize the mean of every column across the rows, and I can't parallelize the max of every rows across the columns, right? So when we're partitioning, we want to partition in a way that allows us to take advantage of the parallelism that every operator has natively. So let's take a look at this data frame. When we talk about data frames, we talk about two axes, the row axis and the column axis. These function just like the x and the y axis in a Cartesian plane. The row axis runs top to bottom, and the column axis runs left to right. We can do a decomposition along each axis, and this is what leads to our partitioning system. If I decompose along the column axis, I split up this data frame into a list of data frames that each contains one or more columns and all of the rows. Similarly, I can decompose along the row axis, and I get a list of data frames that each contain one or more rows and all of the columns. And I can apply these decompositions recursively. So, you know, if I had a decomposition where I had three rows, I could do a column-wise decomposition and get a block partition with three by three. But if I keep applying it recursively, oops, I get this, a cell-wise decomposition where every single data frame is a single cell from the original data frame, right? So with data frame decomposition, we can choose, hey, if this operation is parallelizable along cells, like if I'm adding one to every cell, then maybe I want to be block partitioned because that offers the maximum amount of parallelism. If this operation can be parallelized along every row, maybe I want to transition from block partitions to row partitions and vice versa. Our second idea is metadata independence. 
metadata can be fairly expensive to compute and, uh, and, and very dynamic. So it can change very frequently. The key insight here is that we don't always need metadata. So let's talk about a very specific form of metadata, position. Data frames maintain position, and that's tied to the layout of the data. If I want to compute position over this data frame, I'd have to join all the partitions along the vertical axis in order to figure out like this is row zero, this is row one, this is you know row five, four, row, this is row four, sorry, <laughs> right? But I don't always need position. Let's take a look at an example. Let's say I have this workflow. I say df equals df plus one, so I add one to every cell. I say df equals df colon colon two. That's just a Python for like selecting every even row. And I say df equals df plus two, right? This operation doesn't change the position. And we know this because it just modifies the data in every cell. This operation does change the position. This operation doesn't change the position, but importantly, it doesn't care about position. So rather than computing the position between these two operations, I can defer computing position until I have another operation, maybe similar to this, that requires position and then compute position. So I'm amortizing the cost of computing position across all these things. The third insight is our data frame algebra. So like I said before, it's a minimal set of 16 operators that can be composed to form any data frame query. It's broken up into three main categories. The first is low level operators. So these are operators that directly manipulate data like map in the previous example, for example, df equals df plus one is a cell wise map where we add one to every cell. There's metadata operators like two labels that moves data from the array into of, of data into the index. And then there's relational operators. So these are you know, your standard operators that we've borrowed from relational algebra, like sort, join, concat, et cetera. And the really neat thing about this algebra is because we only have 16 operators, it's a lot easier to hand optimize each one. And if we're thinking you know, longer term, when we deal with queries that are compositions of these operators, it's a lot easier to understand the relationship between 16 operators and how we can compose those operators or reorder those operators than it is to understand how 240 operators fit together, right? So now that we've kind of talked a little bit about the theory, how do we actually design a scalable data frame system? And the key here is modularity. Modularity is at the core of Moden's design. Moden has four layers. The topmost layer is the API layer. And this layer mimics the API of your favorite data frame processing library. So we have the Pandas API, you could add the SQL API. In the future, maybe we would have a, our own Moden API. The second layer is our query compiler layer. And this layer translates from this API layer, which is very wide, again, 240 plus operators, down to our core set of algebra operators. So about 16 operators. Our algebra operators understand how to like manipulate the data in order to accomplish the desired results. That's our third layer. And our fourth layer is our execution engines. And our execution layer understands how to manipulate partitions in order to accomplish the results that the algebra operators desire. So let's take a look at how Moden stacks up against the competition. Functionally, Moden supports over 90% of the Pandas API natively, while Dask and Koalas, some of our competitors, support less than 60% each. If you take a look at actual numbers from latency, we can see on a map along the rows, in this case, the fill and A operation, Moden is about 100 times faster than uh, Koalas. You know? So we can see that Moden really does scale better. On median, we can see that uh, Koalas and DSDF actually aren't on this graph because they require you to manually partition the data frame and don't support operations like median. Well, Moden does out of the box. So we can see here that Moden kind of replicates the flexibility of data frames while adding scalability. You know? So what's the goal here? You know, why are we doing this? What, what are we doing at Ponder, right? The end goal is pandas on everything. You know, with Moden, we have pandas on top of distributed execution engines like Ray and Dask. But ultimately, like Alejandro said, we'd like to be able to push pandas down to databases to really be able to scale pandas. So, you know, if folks think this is interesting, come hit us up. We'd love to see more of you join us. Uh, that's it from me. Okay, that was a whirlwind tour of the technical components. I have some questions, but uh, I also see questions on the chat. Oh, wait, Alejandro has already answered this. Garrett asked, why wouldn't everyone use more than if it's faster in every use case? And the answer turns out to be speed up curves may not be linear at lower scale. You might have overheads, but it also seems like you mentioned that uh, API coverage more than yeah. ahead of everyone else. I have a question on that. You said the score algebra of 16 operators, mm. are all 240 of those functions mapped to only those 16? So like some form of composition of the 16 or is it so yeah. there's some sort of data frame completeness, a lana goes to relational completeness? Yeah, so the whole goal with the data frame algebra was to be complete. So when we started on the first paper towards scalable data frame systems, 
we literally sat down and we went, okay, here are 240 operations. Like these are maps, these are unions, et cetera. Right. And we tried to make it so that any single operation can be expressed as a composition of this relational algebra. Oh, sorry, data frame algebra. I will say we're currently in the process of implementing our data frame algebra. So some operations like sort or join are a little bit more complicated to implement. Uh, that's actually you know, one of the things that I'm working on at Ponder. Uh, and so not everything currently is like fully supported. So that's where like this, like, oh, sorry. That's where like this 5% here comes from. I but see. everything can be expressed as some composition of the data frame algebra. Got it. And the follow-up question to that is, Pandas API, is it closed or does it keep evolving? And if it keeps evolving, do you expect backward compatibility to be maintained by Modin as the operations evolve? What if in the future they come up with some operations in their syntactic sugar that kind of goes beyond your data frame algebra? Yeah, that's a great question. So Pandas is an open source project. So obviously the API continues to evolve. And I think there's really two ways the API can evolve. Um, one is, as you pointed out, syntactic sugar. So we're really seeing the same functionality expressed in different ways. And at that point, the algebra should cover that. The second way is for the API to be extended to manipulate data in ways that we haven't seen previously. And that's totally possible, right? And, and to that, I would point to relation algebra. You know, when we talk about relation algebra, there's like the strict su uh, subset of like the core original relation algebra operators, right? You have like union, uh, Cartesian product, uh, like select project, right? And then on top of that, you have extended relation algebra, which supports a bunch of operations that have been added to SQL databases in the intervening years. So I suspect as we see pandas evolve and continue to mature, we might end up, you know, we'd like, we'd obviously like to think that we future proof your data from algebra and, and we'll never need to add anything, but that's not necessarily going to be the case. So I think as we see the manipulations and the API continue to evolve, it's totally possible to extend our data from algebra beyond those core 16 operators. Got it. Yeah, I mean, SQL RDBMSs support hundreds of functionalities that's not in the original extended relation algebra, like window functions and recursion yeah. and stuff like that. So I think I can imagine data frame systems also evolving in that direction, supporting extra operations in the future. I will say we have a bit of a leg up on SQL or relation algebra. This is, you know, this is like a meta perspective, like my view of like how the API is going to evolve uh -huh. because Pandas, like all of the stuff you described, like windows and stuff like that, that are kind of like in the extended set of relational operators are native to pandas already and data frames already. They're already something that we consider, you know? So in terms of like how it'll grow, I'm not, I'm not saying that it's never going to grow. I just think that, you know, there's already a lot that we've incorporated, you know, like we said, 240 plus unique operators and yeah. you know, anything a database can do, a data frame can do. Um, and with Modin, it can do hopefully as fast as a database can do. So I do think we have a bit of a leg up over SQL in that regard. Got it. Okay, cool. More questions from the audience. So we have a question from Opashanto. Do you want to speak or do you want to just read the question? Okay, I can read the question. Task offers a detailed glimpse into real-time execution via the task graph and the task dashboard. Does Modin have this? Yeah, so Modin does have logging capabilities. So we do log what happens at the partition layer. Um, and so you can kind of build a graph based off of those logs. And uh, some of the work we're doing right now currently has to do with like visualization of what Modin does under the hood. So short answer, like yes, and we're working towards having more completeness. Uh, longer answer, we have logging. We don't necessarily have like a graph, although you can build a graph based off of the logging. And parsers for the logging that we have is, is one of the things we're working on at Ponder. Got it. One other question regarding scale of the data. So you're, in your vision, you said you want to integrate this with the massively parallel data warehouses and Spark and stuff. But what is the current scale that Modin can handle? Is it multi-machine clusters using DAS? So somebody has to set up a DAS cluster or a Ray cluster to be able to run Modin on top of that, right? Yeah. So currently, and you know, all the experiments we run in the paper are either uh, a single machine with very many cores that Ray or DAS is running a cluster on, or as you saw with some of the um, case studies, folks have set up a DAS or array cluster with multiple nodes, and then they're running Modin on top of that. But the really neat thing about Modin is, like we said, there's, there's modularity, right? So it doesn't really matter if you want to use Ray or DAS. You can always plug in your own distributed execution engine, and you would just need to write like a, a shim layer of like, hey, here's how I get data and put data into my execution system, and here's how I like submit tasks and, and get the results from tasks and stuff like that. Got it. Quick question on this one. So both Dask and Ray are task parallel execution engines. So does that mean like Modin expects the data frame to be replicated across the machines and then it places operators on that? Or are you doing 
data parallelism? Yeah, so so this is getting a little into the weeds, but this is actually a great question. Um, the way we do it basically is both Dask and Ray have this concept of uh, of an object store. Well, it's a Ray term, but an object store. So basically, like a a distributed store where you can like put objects and then you get references that can be accessed throughout the system. Mm -hmm. So what we do is if you go back to that data frame decomposition rules, we take the data frame and we break it up into block partitions, right? Uh, and so a block partition is just going to be a cellwise decomposition, but less granular, right? So we can imagine there's like four of these that form a block that form the full data frame. And so we have like four blocks, right? And then what we do is we tell the distributed execution engine, hey, here's a, here's our four partitions. Like, please put these into your object store or your distributed store uh, and give us references to them. And then we have a partition manager that basically goes, okay, if I'm doing a map, if it's a row wise map, I need to get these partitions onto one machine and combine them into a row partition and then do the operation on that. If it's a columnized map, I need these partitions on one machine you know, like this set of partitions, this set of partitions, this set of partitions, and each of these can be on a different machine and you need to do a column wise map on that. And then we leave the actual decision of, you know, where to place these objects and how to replicate them to the distributed execution engine. So ideally, whatever engine you're plugging in is very clever about uh, like scheduling and um, like placing things in proximity when, when they have like very many references that are close together. And so that's not something that Modin directly deals with. Got it. So it's, data partition, but during execution time, you copy on demand onto a machine for the operator, all the data that it needs, rather than doing it in a data parallel manner, like a BSP style, where you aggregate partially and then you send the results. So that depends. So some operations, it, it really depends on, on the type of operation. So this is where that concept of like axes come in, uh -huh. right? Um, first, I, I'm not sure if it's copy. I think it depends on the distribution engine. So it might just be like data transfer rather than copy, although it could very well be copy depending on how the, app, the algorithm is implemented. And that's a detail that is left to the designers of execution engines. Uh, second, we can have, uh, like you said, like partial aggregation. So it really depends on the type of operation. So let's take a look at two. We have mean and we have uh, max, right? So max, you can kind of apply a tree reduce pattern to. And so in that case, what we would end up doing is on each block partition on each machine or wherever that block partition is, you run a max on that partition and you send that result back to the head node, right? And the head node goes, okay, I have a max from this one, this one, this one, this one. The global maximum is this value and here's your value, right? With something like a mean, for example, you can't do a partial aggregation because um, that's just not how mean works, right? Like you, like you need to take well, all the- Maybe that's actually talking in class about this. Technically for the mean you can, because it's an algebraic aggregate. You yeah. The partial sums and the partial counts. And then get the length and then divide by the length. But you can't do a mean on each. Um, right. So the algebraic aggregate decomposes, but you can't do holistic aggregates like median, for example. So you yeah. need the whole data moved there. So I was just curious. So it seems like if you copy all the data to a machine, it has to fit on a machine. Got it. So what's the largest scale of the data that you have tested more than and ponder on? That's a great question. I think, oh, sorry, one, one quick thing, Aaron. I will say for things like mean, we do still have partial aggregation where we take sums and then we compute the mean over partial sums. Right. You're correct. Uh, with median, for example, we would get all the data for one column onto one node and, and then do that. Alejandro, sorry. Uh, do you want to maybe talk about the scale of data we've worked with? What's the largest set of data sets that Modin works up today? So if you had to download it and use it today. Do you have an estimate? Rayhan, you probably have a better sense. I think I think primarily it's constrained by the infrastructure that you're running it on. So it's a single machine disk, right? So it can run up to like a terabyte of data then easily. Yeah, so not necessarily a single machine disk. Again, it kind of depends on what kind of operations you're doing. And the other thing is, yeah, so 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 it, it is constrained by disk if you're doing operations that require full row or column access. So I would say a couple of terabytes is, is where Modin is at right now. But this is primarily a limitation of the distributed execution engine and the way that we're doing it. With, with database pushdown, for example, when Modin transits to SQL, this limitation is no longer present because databases already have a lot of research that goes into like, how do I do like a median over an entire column when it doesn't fit into one device, right? That makes so sense. I mean, it's like 80% of data analytics happens under a terabyte. So Modin is already useful in 80% of use cases today. In this class, we ask the students to work with like 40 gigabyte size data sets. Mm -hmm. They've been using Dask data frame and Dask data frame is not very memory efficient. It's not, Yeah. it runs into a lot of, crashes whereas modern it seems like avoids that by cleverly staging between disk and memory yeah so like Alejandro mentioned uh i can i can tell a little bit inside of that since the snorkel case study is one that i personally worked on they were using dask and, and like you said they had to deal with the fact that you need to manually partition dask and you get a lot of out of memory errors because the partitioning just isn't very good right 
So with Moden, you know, we we automatically, like Moden likes to be in memory. Like that is the best case scenario. I think folks probably understand why, right? Like memory is the fastest to access and, and that's what's best. But if you can't fit in memory, Moden automatically spills to disk. And so with Moden, you don't have to worry about like out of memory erroring if you can't fit in memory. And um, and that's why like Arun points out, like Moden is a bit better, well, a lot better than Dask when it comes to like flexibility. Sounds good. So again, just to quickly clarify, if you're running it on in-memory data on a single machine, just want to use multiple cores, for example, do we still so need to store Dask? Sorry, if you have multiple cores, it will use as many cores as you have or offer it. But do you still need a Dask runtime or is it just a single in-memory runtime that exists where I don't need to install Dask at all for Modin? So that's a great question. So um, the answer is yes and no. So we do have a single threaded um, in-memory execution engine. So that's the, pan, uh, the Python on Pandas execution layer, but that is primarily used for our debugging. So in most use cases, we expect folks to want to be able to parallelize. And I so see. even if I'm running on a single device, uh, well, so you don't even have to set it up, honestly. Like you can just import modin.pandas as PD with the correct execution engine and modin will automatically try to initialize the engine. And so, you know, if I want to run on my, here, I can show you guys a quick example, actually. Let's say I wanted to run, like a, I wanted to run Modin on my laptop, right? All I could do is, you know, IPython, import, sorry, I'm going to type, <laughs> import Modin.pandas as PD. I can say df equals PD dot data frame, make a small data frame. And you can see here, uh, the Ray execution environment is initialized by Modin automatically, right? So if I do import Ray, Ray dot init, that's not how you call that. Oh no, okay. Oh, that's fine. So yeah. it has to import Ray as well for yeah. the machine multi-core environment. Got it. Yeah, so you can see here, like if I create a data frame, like. Uh, let's make a really big one. You can see that it distributes it across all the cores in my laptop. Huh. And then if we take a look at the number of partitions, and again, this is kind of getting really into the weeds here. And this is stuff that most data science practitioners definitely would not need to know about. Uh, right. But if you're interested in systems, then hopefully this thing you'll find interesting. You can see here we have a bunch of partitions, right? And so Ray will basically put these partitions onto different uh, RAMs for each of the cores. Wonderful. Okay, very cool. More questions from the audience. You guys finished the talk pretty good, so we have a lot of time for questions. Yeah. So and there's another comment on the chat. The opportunity cost to adopt modern seems to be almost zero. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if you win the market. Yeah, I think compared to Pandas, Modin seems like a no-brainer. Yeah, so I think like the reason the reason why you feel that way is because one of the main things that we try and focus on with Modin is replicating the Pandas API down to like what errors you get. Like if there is a weird Pandas thing where it's like for some reason Pandas checks errors in this order, and so if you give uh, a command that's invalid with these two parameters incorrect, this parameter will error out first. Moden tries to replicate that as much as possible. Like in our test for Moden, we will actually like check, like, do we get the same error as pandas? Uh, do we get the same text as pandas when we error out? That sort of thing, right? So because of that, you know, we can kind of capitalize on this already existing big fan base for pandas and say like, look, you like pandas? Well, so do we. Here's pandas, but at scale, you don't have to worry about partitions. You don't have to worry about, oh, how do I do a median if my data is on this machine and that machine and, and this other machine? You can just say, I have data, it's on three machines. I want to do a median, give me an answer, right? And I think that that's kind of the selling point of Modin. You don't have to give up pandas, which you really like a lot in order to deal with scale. You can combine what you love about pandas with the scalability you need to like work at scale or to work at like, you know, with industry data. So now that I think about this, one of the question is what read, write and transactional guarantees can you offer with Modin and Ponder? Because right now it seems like you assume that the data is read only. Right, you're tiling it, and then you're doing this block partitioning. You're proposing to build this on top of data warehouses and HDFS, many of which deal with read-only file formats. But one of the nice things about pandas is it's a spreadsheet-style uh, interaction behavior where you can edit it in the cell in place for things like data cleaning, data preparation, and stuff. 
How do you anticipate those sorts of read-write workloads working with Modin and Ponder? Yeah, that's a great question. So Modin is actually um, read-only as well. So with Modin, oh. Whenever you do an operation, and uh, if folks are interested later on, I can like show you actual code, although I think that that might be a little too specific for the purposes of this discussion. But whenever you do an operation on mode, and whenever you run an algebra operator, it actually returns to you a new partition data frame. And the old partition data frame remains the same as it was, right? And obviously, you know, thanks to pandas, oh, sorry, thanks to Python, and thanks to Ray and Das, we have garbage collection. So eventually it does get collected. And so to the user, if you say the in place equals true argument, or if it's like DF equals DF plus one, like to you, it seems like it's in place, but in actuality, all these things are read only. So I think it actually like fits very well with like this idea of like databases being read only because that's how Modin is designed like from the, from the get go. So with a database, for example, like if mode, if, if you do an operation that modifies the data, uh, there's really two ways you could handle this. Just like from a theory perspective, you could always say like, okay, like I'm creating a view on the table with this modified data, or you could say like, Hey, I want to pull the data out of the database and into like my cluster or whatever. Obviously, the second one isn't as ideal because then you get into the same problems as Modin is trying to solve, where it's like, hey, now I need a Ray or a DAS cluster. But the first one is great because it mimics how you work with SQL, right? Like if I want to modify a column in SQL, I create a view on the table and, and modify that column, right? And so that way my original data remains the same, but I also have a view with this modified data. So that's, I think, how Modin can handle this sort of thing. Got it. So you're dealing with copy on write semantics, where an edit would lead to a copy of that block, but not necessarily the whole data frame. Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. More questions from the audience. Is there any more on the chat? Yes, there's one more question. The pandas to SQL transpiler is closed source, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, a lot of people are interested in that. Pandas API to SQL execution engines. So one of those, I don't know if you have this context, but a decade ago, R was... Our data frames were very popular and before Python crossed over, Oracle had this engine called Oracle R Enterprise. And uh, from Duke, Jun Yang's group created something called uh, Riot DB R with IO transparency on database systems. So they created similar things. They kind of had this data frame operations ported to SQL and ORE, I think, did this on PLSQL. So you had procedural extensions. One of the reasons they were kind of struggling with this is a lot of the operations people did with data frame application stacks became very procedural, became a lot of for loops, a lot of iterations and stuff. Do you anticipate those sorts of challenges when you try to layer this on top of declarative engines? That's a great question. Uh, the short answer is, you know, if you'd like to know, you should come join Ponder. <laughs> uh, you know, I can't be giving away all of our secrets right now. Um, I think that's definitely an interesting um, question. And I guess I really can't dive into it without getting into how we generate our SQL code, which is kind of proprietary to Ponder. So I, I'll, I'll leave it at that. If folks would like to know, like come join Ponder, you know, help us build out this vision we see. Okay, sounds good. Well, all the best to you guys, because it is a very challenging problem. Oracle tried this with Oracle R Enterprise for our data frames, and it was very challenging. Um, I, I anticipate that here as well. Now Pandas has grown so big, but it is much more popular, right? much more popular than our data frame was. Okay, any other questions? So Alejandro, I have a question for you too. What sort of uh, domains are you seeing adoption of Modin and Ponder? What sort of application? You gave a few example use cases. Are there more such industries that you can comment on? What sort of data science workflows? It's all over the place. We're seeing stuff in in biotech and genomics, in uh, consumer goods, uh, in e-commerce. Um, some folks at Spotify recently talked about using Modin uh, for speeding up a lot of their A-B testing. Right. So it's really, it's really quite broad. That's good to know. And yeah, that's sort of the value proposition of the PyData stack. The technical skills that you pick up in these sorts of data science degrees, valuable across wide swath of application domains. Exactly. Actually, Arun, now that you mentioned PyData, I'll, I'll include a quick little plug. Alejandro and I are actually doing talks about PyData Global. So if folks are interested in like really getting into like the nitty gritty details of the technical, like how do we come up with our data frame algebra? Like how do we actually apply data frame decomposition rules? What does the data frame algebra and the rules mean for like optimization across queries? Like do turn up for that. I think it should hopefully be interesting. Sorry, quick plug. 
Oh, that's great. And there's also, of course, the VLDB papers. I've referred the students to that paper as well and your blog posts. Okay, so I think that's about it. We don't have any other questions on the chat, but like I said, we will take a closer look as well. And we're hoping to port our assignments to Modin. So you'll hit hundreds of users from UCSD soon <laughs> in the near future. Awesome. Sounds great. Okay. Thank you, Rehan, and thank you, Alejandro, and thank you to the audience for joining. I'll stop the recording here.